I'm Brina Garen, and you're listening to Hex Positive. Welcome, witches. This is episode 12 of Hex Positive. I'm your host, Brina Garen, and this is our first episode of the new year. Woo! Finally! It's been 84 years since 2019. Who wants to join me in burning 2020 in effigy? <laughs> Ye gods. So, it is now January. And I'm going back to a much quieter monthly schedule after the wild rumpus that was the holiday season. That means a full-length episode at the beginning of each month, roughly, and a Which Ways minisode about halfway through. I'm still going to be doing bonus episodes from time to time, but these will largely be released on Patreon, though I may release them in the regular feed later, like I did back in November. So if you are a member of the Patreon, just keep an eye on your feed. And if you're not, if you'd like to help support the show and get those fun podcast extras, you can check out patreon.com slash Sponsorships start as low as $1 a month and they get you access to things like early episode releases, those fun bonus episodes I talked about, and sneak previews of my upcoming projects. You want more witchy? We got more witchy. So check the link in the show notes for more information. The WordPress shop, by the way, is still open as well, and since it's not likely that I'll be attending any live markets anytime soon due to the state safety restrictions, that's going to be the place to go if you want to sample my wares. I'm selling copies of all of my books there, plus vials of various homemade magical powders, witch web kits, witchy buttons, fun stickers, and lots more. I'm adding new stuff all the time. So make sure you head over to brienicarin.wordpress.com slash shop to put in your order. I'll include a link to that in the show notes as well. So today I'm going to be bringing things down just a little bit. I'm going to talk about what to do when you want to be a witch, but you can't. Not because of any gatekeeping or personal doubts, but because of your living situation or because of family resistance. This is another one of those issues that I get asked about quite often, and I wanted to make sure I circled back around to it in the new year, first thing as it turns out, because it happens a lot, and there doesn't seem to be a great deal of material out there that is specifically geared toward this problem that could help. Most books or blogs or what have you seem to kind of assume that the practitioner has access to materials and the freedom to use them. There are plenty of resources that talk about what to do when you have to get creative about acquiring your materials, but what do you do when you can't practice at all? Before we get into the tips and tricks portions, we need to address the pachyderm on the premises the colloquial references to the broom closet. Now, for those who may not know, because common knowledge is not always common, this is an adaptation by the witchcraft community of the older queer community phrase, coming out of the closet, meaning to reveal yourself to your near and dear or to society at large as a queer person. Witches in the modern day have kind of adopted this phrase and added the word broom to express a similar sentiment. So when some witches reveal to their friends and family or their community that they practice witchcraft, they call it coming out of the broom closet. And of course, when they still have to keep their practices under wraps, they call it living in the broom closet or, like the title of this episode suggests, witching 
from the broom closet. And there is some controversy to be had there. Some people in the LGBTQIA community think that this is insulting, or at the very least, an inappropriate use of the phrase. This is a nuanced issue, and I realize that I'm about to oversimplify it, but please bear with me. And please keep in mind that what I'm about to say, I'm saying both as a witch and a queer person, and I am expressing my own opinion on the matter and nothing more. Your mileage may vary. The plight of witches and pagans fighting for the freedom to practice their craft in their own homes without persecution, while it cannot and should not be equated with the battle of queer people to be accepted and not abused or outright killed for just existing, does draw some parallels. Both groups are battling oppressive, conservative, hierarchical systems that refuse to accept them or respect their autonomy based on reasoning historically rooted in religious bigotry. Both groups are fighting to be recognized and protected under the law. Both groups still run the risk of bullying, abuse, assault, ostracization, or even death at the hands of their family or community, depending on where they live. I'm not going to pull a gardener and start comparing statistics here. I'm just saying that it happens. And there is a huge overlap between the witchcraft community and the queer community that cannot and should not be ignored. We may not be fighting exactly the same battle. I mean, obviously, you choose to be a witch. You don't choose to be queer. You're just born that way. But we're fighting for the same things. Equal recognition, legal protection, human rights, positive representation, and social acceptance. We're here. We're queer. We're on the same side here. You follow me? On a personal note... I do feel it's worth mentioning, and we're about to get real personal here, that when I finally decided it was time to come out publicly as a witch to my family members, at least some of them, my mother told me to my face that she wished I had just told her that I was gay, because that would have been easier to accept. And do not get it twisted, my mother is an amazing person who I love very much, and she's been married to an equally amazing woman for the better part of two decades. She just had a harder time as a slightly conservative Christian, accepting that her daughter had decided to be a pagan and a witch that then she would have had accepting me as a queer person, you see. It also bears mentioning that she's been very accepting of my journey as a queer person since I also started flying that bi ace flag, for which I am forever grateful. I love you, Mom. So in that respect, from my personal point of view, and mine alone, although there are some who may agree with me, I think the term broom closet is at least topically appropriate. Some will disagree, and that is their right, and I respect that. Neither community is a monolith. But we are not here to discuss terminology. We are here to talk about how to keep our fellow witches safe. So while I personally approve of this term in my own mind, in consideration for those who are bothered by the closet comparison, I'll be referring to anyone who must practice in secret as a stealth witch. It's a fun term. We can bandy that about, and it means the same thing. So what I'm going to be discussing today may reference situations where witches are coming up against oppression or difficulty from Christian parents or households. This is because this show is based in the U.S., which is a predominantly Christian country, and this is a frequently encountered situation. I mean, I lived through it myself. But please understand that I'm not discounting the experiences of witches encountering resistance from other religions 
or traditions or cultural differences, not just here, but also elsewhere in the world. This experience is hardly unique to one religion or one region or even one country. And there are degrees to the problem, and I fully acknowledge that. So I'm going to try to include as many tips and as much advice as I can in this episode in the hope that no matter who you are or where you live or what your situation is, you'll hopefully come away with something that you can use. Understand also that nothing I say here today is meant to denigrate anyone's faith or spiritual choices. That is a journey that is extremely personal, and I believe that everyone has the right and should have the opportunity to explore and affirm their faith, and also to learn about and experience other religions and traditions in a positive and informative way during their faith journey. And if that experience leads you to move away from the faith you were raised with, that should be your choice. Likewise, if it reaffirms what you already believe and strengthens your connection to your faith, that should be your choice. Even if you pull away just for a while and you go and explore other paths and eventually come back or find a home within another denomination, still should be your choice. All of these things are valid, whether they're connected to your craft or not. It's about what gives you comfort and fellowship and makes you feel spiritually fulfilled and connected to a higher power in whatever form you believe it exists. I believe that everyone should have freedom of religion, including the right to have no religion at all. However, all of this assumes an ideal situation in an ideal world, and I realize that not everybody has this choice. Because sometimes tradition is rigid, or families are strict, and sometimes people react to differing ideology with cruelty and ignorance, which is really unfortunate. We don't want to outright lie to our loved ones if we don't have to, but sometimes for the sake of safety, we may have to kind of lie by omission. And that really is a shame, but it does happen. So... If you are stuck in that sort of limbo where you want to explore these other options, but you can't just yet, there are still things you can do to practice your craft as a stealth witch until things change. The tips I'm giving today are hardly exhaustive, and not all of them will be secular. There are as many ways to be a witch as there are witches in the world, and you'll certainly have to accommodate for your own personal situation. Some of these suggestions are things I've used myself, some are things I know have helped witches I've spoken to in the past, and some are suggestions gathered from internet research. Like I said, I'm going to try to include as much as possible, so just take what you need and save the rest for a rainy day. I'm going to divide these tips into a handful of rough sections which will have a little bit of overlap. Research, materials, veneration, spell casting, and general practice. Like I said, these will overlap in some places. This is just a way to help organize a boatload of material into some semblance of order. And I will be including a transcript of this episode on my WordPress. I know that a lot of people have been asking for it, but with this particular one, I just felt like it was really important to have one. So grab your notebooks. Here we go. We'll start with research. Use technology to your advantage. If you have a personal device that can be locked or password protected, use it. Online drives, cloud drives, thumb drives, ebooks, PDFs, websites, blogs, podcasts, online communities, all of these can be resources for you. 
I've seen people talking about full-blown grimoires kept solely on their Google Drives. I've actually started one myself, and it's very convenient. And all you need for that is an email address. And if you're using a shared computer, I cannot stress this enough. Clear your browser history. Seek out free online archives like Project Gutenberg, Sacred Texts, LibriVox, and so on. The information there might be somewhat antiquated due to being in the public domain, but it's still really good for context. If you have an online ebook reader, you can also look into sites like Scribd, that's S C R I B D. There are plenty of modern books on witchcraft that are available in digital form as well as on paper, but you may have to buy them, which is okay because authors need to eat. There are also university libraries and museums that will sometimes make their collections available to the public, at least in a limited format, online. So look for those as well. Consult the Google Oracle. Look for sites and blogs that talk about the topics that interest you. You will still need to fact check, because that's important, and because naturally these platforms are not regulated, and may be presenting the author's opinion as facts, but at least it gives you a place to start and material to work with. The really good blogs and websites will have lists of resources or recommended reading that you can use to further your info gathering. Use the online witchcraft community as a resource. However, don't rely solely on TikTok videos and Instagram infographics. Look for a platform where you can ask questions and have an actual longer form discussion. There are blog sites that are good for this, like Amino or Tumblr. There are servers or chat rooms on apps like Discord and Skype that are made for this. Getting this quick fix information from short videos or tweets or aesthetic posts might be fun, but it's not going to help you gather useful information and it's not going to challenge you or make you think critically or examine your beliefs and practices. And it's not a great way to get that broader context that's so important to understanding both how magic works and how the witchcraft community functions. So again, just make sure you're looking for those sources. There are loads of witchy podcasts out there besides the ones here on the Nerd and Tie Podcast Network, that's BS Free Witchcraft and Hex Positive, of course. Look for some that align with your interests and add them to your weekly listening. There are also YouTube channels you can check out. Just make sure that you take everything with a grain of salt. And remember that the host may present their opinions as facts, once again, without giving supporting evidence, or they may skew their information to suit an agenda. That doesn't necessarily mean they don't have good information or interesting points to share. It just means you need to listen critically and maybe do some fact checking. And if somebody starts going on about racist or exclusionary practices, you are out. If you have access to a public library, by all means, use it. Public libraries and public computers can be a lifesaver if you don't have privacy on the internet at home. Plus, you have free access to a vast array of books on occult topics, paganism, witchcraft, botany, chemistry, geology, folklore, religion, and history. Plus many more. All of these things are important to your education as a witch anyway, so go find those sources and take notes. Brush off those study skills, they will serve you really well right now. Some libraries or universities also lend digital resources or make part of their archives available online, like I mentioned earlier. If you keep a diary or a dream journal and your privacy with these things is respected, Use a back section of the book for your notes on witchcraft. You can even disguise them as notes on folklore or herbology or crystals 
or artwork if you're into that, whatever your interest might be. Some witches also use multi-subject notebooks or three-ring binders for this purpose, since they just look like school supplies. I actually have a full-sized grimoire in a big D-ring binder. Right now it's about 400 pages long, so I can personally tell you that it does work. And it's a great way of being able to keep your information organized and also cycling it out as you discover new information and new articles. If you can't hole punch your pages, get a bunch of hole punched folders or sheet protectors and use those. You can pick these up at any office supply store. You can also put together a little recipe file or a shoebox full of note cards with spells and research notes on them if you need to do something a little smaller. However, if there is some concern that any of these might be discovered and get you into trouble, then I recommend sticking to things you can password protect. If you're inclined to writing or art projects, pass it off as research for your latest project if anyone asks. You know, if that's a thing you can pull off. Materials. When gathering your accoutrements for witchcraft, remember that aesthetic isn't everything. You can get a surprising amount done with very basic materials, so if you need to keep things lean, that's okay. Don't be afraid to get creative. That's half the fun, really. You can get away with a surprising amount of stuff if you can explain it as regular decor or some kind of art project. Use mundane items and materials that don't attract much notice. Get little things from the dollar store or the craft store, like candles or boxes or beads or yarn or what have you. Go on an expedition sometime. I think you'll be surprised how much you can find. Get your herbs from the supermarket if you don't have another option. There are plenty of things in the seasoning, produce, and tea aisles that you can either dismantle or use directly in your craft, and they raise far fewer questions than a bag of herbs with an occult shop label on it. Tea blends and spice blends can even be ready-made magical mixes. You can look up the properties of the component herbs and then use the blends accordingly. Tea and coffee and other beverages can be potions just as easily as anything brewed in a cauldron. Whether you use a tea blend with a certain set of herbal correspondences, or you add spices to your coffee grounds before you brew it, or just stir your intentions into whatever you happen to be drinking, that is a food-grade potion that no one needs to know about except you. If you have a dedicated mug or thermos, you can also decorate it with stickers or draw sigils or symbols on it for whatever magical purpose you need. If you've got some spare change, you can even go to a paint-your-own-pottery-type place and make a custom piece. One way to disguise your spell work and your supplies is to develop a marked interest in mundane subjects that are related to the type of witchcraft you want to study. For example, if you're drawn to, say, green witchcraft, maybe plant a garden or start learning about herbal medicine. You can have a whole stack of books about plants and herbal medicine and the history of herb lore and practically no one will look twice. It's plausible to sneak a title or two about witchcraft in there if you're very careful. Same thing with crystals and stones. Look for resources on geology and metallurgy and gemology. Read up on the history of the medieval period, the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment in Europe. You can't chuck a stone there without hitting a chapter on witch trials, and that will have information about the superstitious beliefs of the period. And that holds true for most areas of the world. If there was a witch panic at any point, the history books will talk about it, and there's always something to be learned there. Folklore and mythology might be towing the line, but you can use resources on those topics to learn, in an oblique way, about other cultures and traditions if you don't have any other options. Even poetry and literature can be a resource if you can't study other religions and traditions directly. 
Some of us may remember a seemingly random middle school language arts unit on Greek myths that taught us an awful lot about the Hellenic pantheon, just out of nowhere. At the very least, there will be far less questions about any materials you start bringing home that are related to your hobby than if you just start plunking down books on witchcraft. Speaking of gardening, having houseplants is a common practice these days, so you can get yourself a little pot of herbs or a succulent for a bit of greenery. There's opportunity for green magic in these things, even if you live in an apartment. If you like candles and you're allowed to have them in your space, if you're in a dorm, please don't, invest in a small array of jar candles in your favorite scents and colors. These are easy to use for color and candle magic alike, and if anyone asks, they're there for the ambiance. Just make sure you practice fire safety. And if you can't have open flame, like in a dorm, use LED candles instead. They work just as well. These are readily available at houseware stores, and they come in lots of colors. Some of them are scented, too. Some even come with little remotes or phone apps, so you can change the color of the light to whatever you want. They're actually really, really cool looking. I don't actually recommend using incense if you're a stealth witch. This is one of the harder materials to explain away, unless you live in a home where incense is already present. And even then, you may have to explain why you're burning it. Plus, it can set off allergies and smoke alarms, and generally it can just turn into a hassle. So use your best judgment, but maybe hold off on the incense for the time being, unless you know for sure that it won't raise suspicion. Twig brooms and cinnamon brooms are common items sold for decorative purposes in craft stores, especially around the holidays. If it won't cause problems, you can acquire one and keep it as a besom for your craft. You can even decorate them with bells, herbs, silk flowers, ribbons, and so on, whatever you want. And then they become charmed objects that double as household decor. I also recommend things like twig wreaths and silk flower bunting for this same purpose. And yes, I know I rag on aesthetic a lot, but damn it, if aesthetic is important to you and you've got some room to move in that area, freaking go for it. If you can keep a private shoebox or a lockbox that won't be messed with, use that as a miniature altar or storage for your materials. This is helpful if you want to have things like cards, crystals, small books, and so on, or if you absolutely cannot keep anything out in the open. Also, a quick note regarding cards. You can use a deck of standard bicycle playing cards to read the minor arcana if you want to practice your tarot skills. Clubs are wands, hearts are cups, spades are swords, and coins or pentacles are diamonds. Jars and little storage containers are great for small container spells and also for keeping your supplies organized. When things are tucked away, there tend to be fewer questions. Veneration. If you want to make an altar for veneration, use mundane items that are associated with your chosen deity or deities, but won't attract attention. This can include things like silk flowers, animal figurines, art prints, etc. And try not to make it look too much like an altar, if you follow me. Don't go hard with the candles and the statues. Just keep it simple. Make it look like a collection of small decorations. This is much easier to explain away and doesn't usually raise suspicion. If you can't have your altar out in the open, like I mentioned before, you can make a shoebox shrine. If that's too much of a risk, try an Altoids tin. Or you can draw the altar you'd like to have and let that be your representation. Remember that no two altars are alike, and they don't have to include deities if you don't wish to. Altars can just as easily have representations of nature, or the elements, or the planets, whatever your chosen path happens to be. 
It can be something as simple as a plant on a windowsill. It doesn't have to be fancy or look a certain way. It just has to work for you. Have a playlist for your deities and your craft. It doesn't have to be made up of particularly witchy songs. You can pick classical or popular pieces that remind you of your gods or of your power, and singing or playing that music then becomes a magical act of veneration. If your interest in the craft doesn't include a desire to leave the religion you were raised with, you may be able to find ways to blend them. Christian witchcraft is a thing, after all, and we love us some loopholes. This may not work for every religion, but it's worth looking into. If there's a branch of the Unitarian Universalist Church in your town that you can safely visit, that might be a place of sanctuary as well. The UU Church is accepting of all religions, including a lack thereof, and may have resources or like-minded individuals you can connect with. At the very least, it might be a safe space outside your home where you can breathe a little and still quote-unquote go to church without things being quite so strict, and where maybe you can carve out a little place for yourself. Spellcasting. Attach your spells to everyday objects that require little or no alteration. Clothing and jewelry can be imbued with protection spells, for example. You can wear certain colors for simple color magic. If you're crafty, you can put your spells into mundane decorations or artwork without overt symbols. If you do any kind of sewing or yarn craft, you can weave spells into those projects as well. I mentioned hobbies before. This is where they will serve you well. Draw sigils with your fingertip rather than with chalk or markers. The sigil is still there because you put your intent and your will into it when you draw it, but it's also nice and invisible, and you don't have to have the uncomfortable conversation about why you've just drawn that weird squiggly thing on the wall that now may or may not wash off. If you find or create sigils that you can just pass off as artistic designs, that does make things easier, and you can afford to be a little more open with how you use them. I highly recommend L. Tempest Zaycroft's Sigil Witchery for ideas on how to create your own sigils for this purpose. Check your local library or look up the ebook. Use a favorite writing utensil as your wand. It can be a fancy pen or pencil or something that you decorate and then hang on to long after the ink has dried up. This is easy to conceal among school or writing supplies and works just as well as much fancier wands for most spells. Again, because you're putting the weight of your intent and your will behind what you're doing. In a pinch, your index finger can also be your wand if the spell you're performing requires a gesture of some kind. I do this all the time if I don't have my favorite wooden spoon to hand. And yes, Wooden spoons can be wands too, especially for kitchen witching. Remember also that it's almost never completely necessary to say your spell or incantation out loud. You can whisper it, mouth it, sign it, or just think it very clearly. There's a lot to be said for silent spellcasting. If you want to make a low-key circle, that's a low key circle, not a low key circle. I'm sure there's a vast yawning chasm of difference. If you want to make a low key circle, use a ball of yarn. Unravel a few yards, make that circle, do whatever you were planning to do, and then just wind it back up again. Or if you don't want to risk a physical circle, just trace one with your hands or your feet. Walk out a boundary and then sit inside of it. You can open the circle with a hand gesture when you're done. Use magical timing to your advantage. Brush up on the correspondences for the days of the week and your lunar, solar, and planetary cycle lore. All of these things can help you enhance what magics you're able to perform without adding extra materials. 
employing color magic is another easy thing to work with, such as wearing your favorite green shirt for luck, or lighting a red candle for attraction and personal empowerment that also happens to smell like apple pumpkin. You can pass off charm bags as bath bags or loose leaf tea blends or drawer sachets if you have to. They're easy to make, highly customizable for any magical purpose, and if you use pre-made bags, they can look just like the fancy things your auntie buys at Bed Bath & Beyond. Put them wherever you need to. Stick them in your drawers, use them for ready-made tea making, or use them for bath magic. More on that in just a minute. You can use decorative book boxes or buy old dictionaries secondhand and hollow them out to make hiding places for your supplies. Some of these look like decorations, but it's surprisingly easy to find or make hideaway books that could fit in on your regular bookcase. If there's a head shop near you, check out some of the items they have for concealing your stash. There's no rule that says these can't be used for other materials, and they look very innocuous. Pencil cases are also great for storing your witchy accoutrements. Again, it looks like school supplies. It's small and portable and easy to stow away or carry with you. And they come in all sorts of neat patterns. Thread magic can easily be done under the guise of making friendship bracelets. Is that still a thing? Or fiber arts, like embroidery, needlepoint, knitting, or crocheting. There's a lot of magic you can do with weaving and stitching that just looks like handicrafts to the outside observer. You can wear bracelets made of crystals or stones as fashion accessories. Lots of folks wear these so they don't draw much attention. You can also make your own charm bracelet with whatever charms you want, things associated with your craft, and it just looks like regular jewelry. I have an entire altar that I can wear on my wrist, made just of craft store, chain, and a handful of charms. Stick a charm or sigil for money-making inside your wallet or your change jar to bring in additional funds and keep your financial prospects sunny. These are easily tucked away and can be explained as good luck charms, which is exactly what they are. For cleansing, you can make room sprays with water and essential oils. These are super easy to put together in a spritz bottle, and then you just shake them up and mist the corners of your room as you do the cleansing ritual in your head, and voila! Plus, it makes the room smell nice, and parents and roommates alike love a clean-smelling room. They can also be done with potpourri or reed diffusers, if that's something you can have around. You can also cleanse with light or sound by lighting a candle, opening up the blinds or the windows, or playing your favorite feel-good music and using these things to push out any negativity that might be lingering in your space. You can also practice visualization techniques for this same purpose, and I do recommend learning them anyway as part of your education on warding and shielding magic. There's an episode of Witch Ways from back in October 2020 called Don Thy Armor that walks you through one of these visualizations if you're interested in a place to get started. To make moon water on the down low, all you really need to do is leave a bottle of drinking water in the window under the light of the full moon. That's it. If it's already potable, then you have a ready-made base for consecrated water, consumable potions, saining, which is cleansing by flicking water drops around, or just to drink as is so you can hydrate and infuse yourself with extra lunar witchy goodness at the same time. Work your spells into your daily routine. Banish your troubles as you take out the garbage. Cleanse your home while you tidy and scrub. Do some growth magic while you water your garden, even if it's just in a windowsill. Keep a spare change jar that doubles as a money draw spell. Put on beauty or confidence glamours when you wash your face or apply makeup. Bless your face mask for protection from sickness and bad luck while you're out and about. If you have an inclination to cooking, practice that kitchen witchery. 
That tea and coffee potion trick I mentioned earlier is just the beginning. You can use herbs with particular correspondences or just bless the food as you make it by stirring blessings into the pot or the bowl or sprinkling them with your seasonings. Salt is a great multi-purpose substance and you can easily pick up free salt packets from takeaway restaurants or grab a cheap salt and pepper duo from the grocery store. They're just condiments after all. Bath spells are similarly easy to work into your daily life. Turn your daily ablutions or skincare time into witchcraft. Use your time in the shower to draw sigils on your skin in lotion or soap, and then cast them by rubbing in the lotion or washing the soap off. Some soaps even have herbs in them, like rosemary or lavender, that you can use for their correspondences. You can scrub with intent as a method of personal cleansing whenever you feel you need one. If you have time for a soak, you can use bath sachets or salts or bath bombs for magical purposes. There are even recipes online for making your own if you want to use a particular herb or scent. I've also recently discovered how much fun bath lights are, and I definitely recommend seeing if you can find one of them at a houseware store or perhaps online. What it is is a waterproof LED light pod that suction cups to your wall and you can turn it all different colors with a remote. It works equally well in your bathtub or in your shower. It's great for mood lighting, for meditation, or a little color magic while you sluice down. Setting the household wards can be as simple as locking your front door. Every day, I set the wards in my home with a twist of my key and then a press of my hand against the number plate. There are lots of options for set it and forget it magic that is similar to this. You put the spell in place when you have the house to yourself, and thereafter you just activate it by going about your day and doing things you would normally do. General practice. If you have to attend services as part of your familial duties while you're living at home, and it doesn't actively put you in danger to be there, just do it. I know it can be difficult. It can even be grating. Just look at it as an obligation. No one says you have to participate beyond going through the motions, and it will help to keep the peace at home. If you can convince your folks to let you skip church or synagogue or what have you, or if your family doesn't attend weekly services, this might not be a problem. But if you are required to go, and it would either cause suspicion or start a huge fight if you refuse, just grin and bear it until you have a better option. I know it sucks, but sometimes we have to do things that we don't like or even that are distasteful to us so long as they are not physically harmful in order to safely bide our time until we can do what makes us feel fulfilled. I should also mention that if you're one of my listeners living in a country where practicing witchcraft is actually illegal, and yes, that is still a thing in some places, please do not put yourself in danger. Do what you have to do to get by until you have the option to leave doesn't matter if you have to restrict yourself to research for a while. It doesn't matter if you can only work certain kinds of spells or you can't keep an altar. It doesn't matter if you have to keep your practice entirely secret for years and never cast a single spell until you have your own home. You are still a witch if you want to be one, and you are still valid. If you don't progress in your studies as quickly as the people on the internet, that is okay. It's better for you to be safe. Move at your own pace and be patient. Meditation and mindfulness are becoming common practice, so take advantage of this. You can practice your grounding and centering in this way, and it just looks like calming mental exercise, which it is, but with multitasking. 
There are loads of witchcraft-related apps out there. Lunar calendars, horoscopes, tarot readers, plant identifiers, little fun spell-a-day things, and lots of them are free. Put a few on your phone if you can. Tuck them away in a folder if you have to, but at least that's something you can carry with you. If you can get away with maintaining an interest in magic on a pop culture level, you can explain away a lot of things as, oh, that's just a thing from Harry Potter, or yeah, I saw it on Charmed and I thought it was neat, that sort of thing. Even vague explanations for items like, oh, it's a thing from a book or a TV show or a video game can help to prevent difficult conversations. There's a lot of artwork, clothing, and accessories out there that look vaguely witchy, but are sold by perfectly ordinary retailers. You don't have to wear a pentacle. Use a star instead, just a plain star. You don't have to wear the Wiccan moon sign. Get a moon-shaped pendant instead. Look for things with nature themes or crystals or graphics that align with your craft, or just fall back on that color magic. There are ways of working your witchy aesthetic into your regular wardrobe without relying solely on pentacles and solid black everything. Use seasonal festivals and celebrations to your advantage. There's a lot of scope for secular witchcraft in seasonal traditions, as I mentioned back in episode 11. If you can find a way to make something witchy in a subtle or personal way, do it. No one has to know about it but you. If there are decorations you're allowed to put up that you can imbue with magical significance, do that. Don't push it too far, but if you can put up a leafy bunting or a moon tapestry or an art print and it helps you feel witchy in your private space, go for it. If you have a place that you can get away to, use that for your practice. Try not to clutter it up with too much material, especially if it's outdoors, but trade on whatever privacy or solitary habits you already have. Whether it's a daily walk in the park or a favorite coffee shop you can disappear into for an hour now and then, or a trip to the library, like I mentioned earlier, try and get that time for yourself. If you have a trusted friend you can rely on to keep your secret and provide you with resources or a safe place to practice, that may be an avenue of escape for you. I practiced my craft in a friend's basement for at least two or three years before I got my own place. Hi, Jen. Just make sure that it is someone that you can trust implicitly. You don't want the whole thing to come crashing down because somebody ratted you out. Be aware that just as there are people in the witchcraft community who are honest and genuinely want to help you out, there are also people who prey on those who are new or naive or in difficult situations. Trust your instincts and watch for red flags. If something makes you uncomfortable, you do not have to do it. And if a person or group tells you it's necessary for continued participation, walk away and sever all contact. That is not a healthy situation to be in. And it's not worth trading a bad steak for bad sushi, if you follow me. Just because it's different doesn't mean it's necessarily better, and it's still important to be discerning. I'm hoping to have a guest host on the show later this year to talk about this in more depth, but for now, just remember to use those critical thinking skills and trust your gut. You don't want to wake up one day and find you've accidentally joined a cult. There are always nuances and variations in situation to be considered. Some people can get away with their interest in the craft so long as their family thinks it's confined to books and movies. Some people aren't even allowed access to media that isn't in line with their family's religious beliefs. Some people have a little wiggle room to explore. And some people are on a terrifyingly short leash. Learn to read the room. 
Witchcraft is an act of rebellion, and many young people do see it as such. But if you live in a highly conservative or, gods forbid, unsafe household, rebellion may only be tolerated within certain parameters if it's tolerated at all. If you can realistically get away with small things like having candles or Halloween decorations or witchcraft adjacent items, there might be space to push that envelope just a little bit. But if there's just no wiggle room on anything that's remotely outside the beliefs or cultural structure of your household, or if your parents or housemates are very strongly averse to anything to do with witchcraft, don't push your luck. Either go full stealth, work completely off-site, or hold off until you can change your living situation. When in doubt, don't do the thing, even if it seems important. There is no spell or ritual or festival or offering or ceremony that is more important than your safety, okay? Your desire to live free or let your witch flag fly or stick it to the man should never ever outweigh your common sense and your sense of self-preservation. Keep that roof over your head and keep yourself in one piece first. The craft will still be waiting when it's safe for you to come back to it. On a practical note, if you're in an abusive situation or you don't feel safe in your home, please understand the situation is not your fault, and you do have the right to seek out help however you can. Please seek out those resources and do whatever you have to to keep yourself safe. I suggest looking up your local emergency hotline and also taking advantage of the numerous online counseling services that have sprung up since the pandemic started. Those can really be a lifesaver. And like I mentioned at the top of the episode, if you're able to reach out to other witches, do it. This is an invaluable resource, and I fully credit community outreach with a great deal of the progress I've been able to make as a solitary witch. There is a perspective that comes with community interaction that you just can't get any other way. You can get involved in forum discussions or join a Discord server. Hey, join the Nord and Tide Discord server. We're a fun bunch of people. Or you can ask questions of other practitioners. It's a great way to get information, to make friends, and start building your own personal community. And I promise you, since I get this all the time, there is no such thing as a stupid question. And if you want somewhere to start asking people, my inbox is always open. So, That does it for this month's episode. Like I said, this list of tips is not exhaustive, but I do hope that it's given you some ideas, maybe some touch points for further brainstorming, or at the very least, a little reminder that, hey, hi there, you're not alone, okay? Just remember that as you go along. If you get depressed, if things feel hopeless or frustrating, There are always other witches out there who are willing to listen and help. So keep yourself safe out there, and if you need help, reach out, okay? We're back to our regular schedule this month, so look for a new episode of Witch Ways in a couple of weeks, and I'll be back in February with some highly salty thoughts on modern love magic. Until then, I'm Brina Garen, sending great big love to all my stealth witches out there. Hit me up if you need anything. And reminding you to stay safe, keep wearing your mask, and keep your chin up. Hex Positive is a proud member of the Nerd and Tie Podcast Network. Check out everything they have to offer, including our sibling podcast, BS Free Witchcraft, over at nerdandtie.com. Intro and outro music by Kevin McLeod. For all the latest updates, follow at Hex underscore podcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at at Brina Garen on Twitter and Instagram. For more information on my books, you can check out my WordPress and my Amazon author page. And if you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash Brina Garen. Stay safe, wash your hands, 
And remember, always practice safe hex.